I'm going to try and condense an entire 45-year uh, career into uh, 25 minutes, so <laughs> I'll be talking very fast, excuse me. Um, how to grow a sustainable, profitable business. We all want to be sustainable. Um, that means not throwing a lot of things away, like perfectly good customers or bringing in. Uh, it, the most wasteful thing you can do is mess up a human life, and that's what many companies are doing inadvertently. So let me show you a couple of companies as a case study that one started out on the right foot, Hertz. Um, back in the early 1900s, a uh, fellow bought a dozen or so Model T Fords and built a company. Um, Hertz, by the way, means uh, stout-hearted or good-hearted in old German, I'm told. And, and that's how they grew. They, they treated customers well. It, it, you might think he described it, Hertz described it as a customer-centric mindset that he had. Um, but I would also describe it as entre entrepreneurial-centric. Everyone with any common sense that succeeds in business knows they have to treat customers well or it can't succeed. Um, but as you see, Hertz today um, is only eight, eight or nine billion in revenues. Enterprise founded uh, long after Hertz, 40 or 50 years later. After the time Hertz had established a number one position, um, Enterprise just blasted past them if they were standing still. And, and I've always wondered, how can this happen? Because in a business, think, think back if, if you, this might be your parents remembering, but it, if you remember when Enterprise was n almost nothing, Hertz was number one, Avis was number two, they were dominant, they were the biggest purchasers of automobiles in the world. You wouldn't expect a little startup in a commodity business like car rental, a little startup like Enterprise could do this. And, uh, but today, largest in the world, 30 billion in revenues. Hertz, by the way, uh, just went bankrupt a couple years ago. So in, the economic shift is mind-boggling, and I, I've read about Hertz and why it stopped succeeding. They got sold to General Motors and, and then to Ford Motor Company. And what was a customer-centered mindset shifted to what people would, some people would say it's an investor-centered mindset, but it's not. It's a financial accounting-centered mindset because these big bureaucracies that accountants run because that's who measures progress, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but if you pay your bonuses on financial accounting and you measure progress and report it to the news and the Wall Street using financial accounting, suddenly your brain is infected by financial accounting mentality. And that is very different than the customer-centric mindset in the early years of Hertz and still going at Enterprise. When I asked Andy Taylor, the fellow who built Enterprise into the giant success story it is today, he said these words. And I heard them, but I didn't really hear them at that time. He said, there's only one way to grow a business. And he said, a profitable, sustainable business. You treat your customers so they come back for more and refer their friends. That simple idea is what it means to have a customer-centric mindset. But financial accounting does not measure those two things. It doesn't measure how much of your business is coming from repeat customers and their growth, and it doesn't measure how much of your business is coming through referrals. So if you have a financial accounting mindset, you're almost doomed to the Hertz outcome, which is a pretty sad thought. I tried to change the world by writing a book, and I had no idea what I was doing. I, I wasn't a writer. I didn't even take an English class in college. I had no idea that I'd need to learn how to write. But I figured out enough to get an idea out there, that I, and I thought I had it. It said, you have to stop thinking about a financial accounting mindset. You have to think about a customer as a lifetime investment in return. This, this idea of lifetime value or net present value, if you want to take the time value of money into account. And this book, which is now 30 years old, it was a bestseller, it continues to sell, um, just laid out how to think about lifetime value. And this is the right way to think about a business. So, you know, customers are creating all of the cash flow in the business. Why you, don't, you should all be keeping track of these things, not just repeat purchases and the growth, but um, they're more efficient. When you serve a long-term customer, there's just all sorts of friction that goes out of the system. I think the biggest mistake I made in this calculation was referrals. I underestimated it. We didn't know how to measure referrals. I knew they were important, so I was conservative. Turns out, as, as mentioned me, has gotten more data available. I think in most businesses, you'll see referrals are bigger than any other component, maybe more than half of that entire calculation. 
Um, but this was great for something. It was great for strategy, how to rethink the business. It was useless in how to make different decisions today or hold people accountable, because this equation is working over time. I came up with a single uh, sort of a summary statistic to help people manage this, implement it. Retention rate. I said, you know, how long they stay. If you know this pattern for your business on average, if you just look at customer retention rate or churn rate, you'll be able to make a good estimate of how much impact, financial impact you have. And so I, I, I don't know if you ever remember this statistic or hear of it, but if you change your retention rate by five points, you can swing your customer lifetime value by up to 100% or more. Well, that's just this math. It was good, but not good enough, and it wasn't changing the world. So I, I said, how am I going to come up with a metric, a summary statistic that is more immediate? I mean, you can't run a business based on learning from defections because they happen down the road and it's hard to figure out what the triggering event was and how do you p hold the person accountable who had the lousy phone call that then spiraled into that customer def uh, defecting three years later. You need something immediate, real-time learning. And as much as I don't like surveys, I thought there is no better way than just to ask somebody one question. And the best question was how likely you'd recommend this to a friend. Um, I didn't know it at the time, uh, how this is the essence. You know, when you treat it, when you enrich someone's life, they'll refer you to a friend. Not because they love you, it's because they care about their friend. They want their friend to have that good experience. It's a completely free way to grow your business. And it's, it's more about love that that person has for their friend than the, the sort of an economics of the business. But back to when this was invented, I wrote a book called uh, The Ultimate Question. Then lots of people adopted this idea on a you know, zero to 10 scale, nines and tens are promoters, you all know this, and most of the world knows this, and it, it lets you have a single score. You just take the people you've enriched their life, the promoters, subtract the percentage whose lives you've diminished, detractors, and, uh, and you have a really nice summary statistic that is real time. And people adopted it, they loved it. The problem was, they need to hold people accountable to this, not just learn. And so more and more people were putting this in bonuses. And, and it turned the score into a joke, because if you link it to someone's compensation, they care more about the score than they do about learning from the feedback from the customer. You know, the second question is, why? And that's the, the vital, the key insight of the net promoter system is knowing if you've enriched a life or diminished a life, but then why and what you should do about it. Um, the truth of net promoter reflecting the underlying economics is still pretty powerful. I, I invest, invested personally when I wrote that, the, the, the ultimate question 2.0, which laid out the whole system. We, at that point, could measure net promoter score for competitors across an industry pretty effectively. And I invested in each of the leaders in NPS that, I could, that were public companies and I could invest in. Enterprise is still private, so sadly, I haven't been able to get, prosper from them. But for the others, my investment returns multiplied my money by 10 times, 10.1x, while the stock market on average grew at tripling. That, in an annual return sense, is over 25% per year. It's unheard of. It's better than almost any private equity fund you, you find. That's astonishing. And if, and if you were, you know, if I were pitching you as an investment advisor, you'd say, Show me the, the proof. How, how is, could it possibly be that you're beating the market by this much? Well, it's back to common sense. Think of that Andy Taylor thing about treating your customers so they come back for more and bring their friends. Um, and these are the people that I wrote about in this last book. I wrote about them because they had the highest net promoter score, correctly measured, apples to apples, scientific rigor from a Bain NPS prism I'll talk about in a little bit. But NPS prism measures NPS as if it really mattered as much as a financial statistic. And this is the total shareholder return of some of the exemplars. You've heard of most of them, but the one that uh, I'll talk about is the one you've probably never heard of called First Service. First Service had total shareholder return over the last decade of over 500%, similar to companies you have heard of, like Amazon and Apple. But First Service is operating in lousy commodity businesses like painting houses and, uh, and redoing your closet, uh, stuff that, in a commodity like car rental, like enterprise. 
And, and I'm, I, I actually am so interested in this company, I joined the board of directors. And if you go back 25 years, their return is over a tw is 20% per year for 25 years. It's almost unmatched in the history of business. How does it happen? Well, they get the same insight that Andy Taylor got. You got to generate people who come back and, and generate referrals. But in the painting business, you don't paint your house every year. Why would you delight a customer and, and earn a referral? Because it's the only way you get more revenue out of that customer is when they refer their neighbor. If you do a great job, the logic of, oh, I'm going to get repeat business, you know, the net present value if you're talking seven or 10 years down the road for the next house repainting. But they've managed to teach their teams that when they go to a job, the objective is not just to paint the house efficiently, it's to wow the customer and generate at least one referral. So they lay out a pattern of how they deal with the customer, that the end of the journey, they have a, when the painting is done, they have a pride walk where they take the customer around and show them all the wows that they might have missed along the way, and it makes it a perfect time to generate referrals. And, uh, and that whole mentality of my job, when I go see a customer, is to wow them and get a referral. That's why, inter that's why first service has a return on investment that's astonishing over 20 years. It's so common sense. But what they've done in their public company, they've been able to let people remind their frontline teams the job is not what the financial accountants tell you to do. The job is to certainly operate within those constraints, but the objective is to delight a customer. So impressively, they refer their friends. So let's get to generic ideas. These black bars represent a typical a passive or attractor customer and what their life cycle contribution is over the, over the time they would do business with you. That is what accountants see. What I contrast that to are the gold bars, which are promoters, people who really feel like their life has been enriched. And this is conservative because it doesn't take into account referrals. Remember, financial accounting doesn't know how to measure referrals. There's no, there is nothing in FASB principles about referrals. Um, if you take the referral effect, it really is remarkable how these gold bars um, create a cash flow engine that's far, far superior to the black bars. So when, you know, in the simplest sense, when I talk about first service or enterprise rent-a-car or Apple, they are building a business on gold bars. It's just a far superior cash generation engine, customers coming back for more and referring their friends, and it's invisible to all those who see the world through accounting lenses. Some people who were not confused by accounting lenses, uh, Ben Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the United States, he, he recognized this compounding interest. It, you know, it, it, he thought of interest, um, making money on money, the, the money that money makes, and you make money on that money, and, and so on and so forth. He wanted to teach the world. This was such an important principle. He left, uh, I think, 1,000 pounds to two cities, to Boston and Philadelphia. And, and insisted they, they not use it for, ten, for 100 years. And it grew into millions, of, millions and millions of dollars. And that was his education. Warren Buffett, one of the richest guys in the world, most successful business people, his businesses get this. They behave as if treating customers so they come back for more and refer their friends. He puts compound interest in his annual report. Look on the inside cover of every annual report. It shows the compound interest effect of his returns versus the stock market in general. Uh, just to bring this to life a little, um, as I've, we've had grandchildren, I, uh, I want to pay for their college education. So in the United States, they have a thing, a tax deferred account called the 529. So if I put $10,000 when the child's born, um, that will compound, let's use 10% interest because it's a tax uh, free account. That compounds up over, until the child is 21, that would go be $80,000. 10,000 to 80,000, you know, eight times in 21 years. Well, that's sort of cool. But what if I could say to the parent, my kids, hey, if you could, you know, get a scholarship, pay for their education, let it roll because the U.S. changed the rules. You can actually keep that money in that 529 until retirement tax-free and have it compound up. Do you know what it compounds up to when someone's 60 or 65 years old? It's over $5 million. So $10,000 uh, 
turns into five million. Now, if my wife gives 10,000 and I give 10,000, we have just given our grandchild a retirement with $10 million, which, you know, your brain doesn't, it's not intuitive. I think that's, that's my message. You're, you're gonna have a hard time intuitively making wise choices when there's compound interest at play. These guys get it, and uh, I'd like you to get it. This is a typical business, and, and uh, Andy and the Mention Me team put together, well, if you've got somebody that's gonna spend $240 over two years in a monthly subscription, whatever kind of business, that's what lifetime, that's what a financial accountant would see. What if instead you use this Serta Pro mentality that I want to uh, not just earn that customer's repeat business, but I want to get a friend, and that each new customer also refers a friend, that's what the curve looks like. That's a Serta Pro lifetime value of a customer. That's a typical company who's thinking about a financial accounting only effect, because remember, financial accounting ignores referrals. Um, and that just assumes that a referred customer is the same quality as a, any other customer. That's wrong. In almost every business I see, the uh, referred customer is higher quality. They tend to buy more. I think this is real data from, from one of the mentioned me clients, just to, to, instead of Fred's general rules. 11% more was what the Mention Me team found for a typical business among you. The uh, lifetime value is 56% more because they their retention is higher. And the, uh, they, they refer more. And if you take all of those effects into account, you know, the compounding effect that I've just shown you is understating it. It's actually 36% higher. So over a 10-year period, if you think about the amount of value that that customer is really generating, it's astonishing. And you can't ignore the, the quality of customer effect. It's, it's vital. But back to the idea of money making money on money that makes money that make referrals that generate referrals that then recur, that create customers who generate more referrals, that is what creates a great business success. And it's not being measured in most parts of the world today or managed. In this situation, that creates a 77% compound annual growth rate. If you just get one referral every uh, new customer that comes in, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? How many of you are growing at 77% a year? Um, is it possible to get two referrals out of one customer? Of course it is. If you actually were measuring and managing and optimizing and investing in wowing customers as if the job was not to maximize profits this quarter, but to enrich as many lives as you possibly can so they turn into promoters and assets who, who grow your business for you much more effectively than the sales force can, because customers are credible. Um, so this leads, why winning on purpose, my book, because I think the only winning purpose is to enrich the lives of customers. That's the highest principle. It inspires your teams. Um, loving customers. Um, this is not so much customers loving you. You can get loyalty out of customers, but this is love for your customers, sort of like grandparents for their grandchildren, always acting in their best interest, uh, sustainably enriching their lives. But this... Uh, this sort of falls apart when you get into business accountability. When the Hertz gets to the scale where they're bought by General Motors or people go public, suddenly they lose the customer-centric mindset and they move to an accounting-centric mindset, which makes them do things that hurt customers and hurt employees as if that were a smart way to build a business. Um, you know, if you get paid your bonus on dollars, what is the, what's the key idea behind winning on purpose? Well, uh, and how do I hold people accountable? Because remember, if, if dollars from the financial guys is not enough, how can I, what do I have to measure? And winning on purpose makes a case that, you know, retention rates are great, net promoter scores are great, but frankly, we need an accounting rigorous metric that you can use to hold people accountable to treating them right and having them come back for more and bring their friends. So what, what do you measure for back for more? It's net revenue retention. Of all of your revenue this period, 
how much is from customers who did business with you last period. It's a simple idea. Some of you are already measuring it. I think that's a fundamentally, if I only had one number from a business to see how healthy it was, a mature business, that might be it. I think every one of you ought to go back to your CFO and insist that this is a central metric that you keep track of and understand. The other one, um, how many new customers are coming in as a result of referral from an existing customer? Those two things really capture the essence of what, uh, what Andy Taylor understood, of the executives at First Service, all of the companies I've invested in. And it, it opens up a door to your business to not just be financially more successful, but actually inspire your workforce. Um, if you, another way to think about earned growth rate is just if your revenue growth looks like that, that's what the accountants measure and report to, uh, to the world. You gotta decompose that into repeat business net of churn, and then for new customers, how much of it's earned through referral and how much is bought through uh, getting your Google search uh, uh, elevated to the top of the chart or paying a high, uh, high cost sales force. And what, you, what this shows is two different businesses with the same reported revenue growth can have wildly different underlying earned growth and therefore wildly different futures. But it's invisible unless you sort of bring earned growth to the forefront. Now, earned growth is something, your account, it's, re, it's real. You already know how to audit these numbers except for referrals, but net revenue retention is pretty easy for the accountants to deliver on. So, how to think about earned growth? How does it fit with this whole set of tools that you have to be more customer-centric? When I started with the, the loyalty effect, I focused on that one. Retention rates, because of the life cycle, life cycle of a customer, um, you focus on customer lifetime value, retention is the summary statistic. It's a pretty good star for guiding your ship. Uh, it's not perfect. It got a lot better when we uh, introduce closed loop feedback. When someone defects, get to the root cause, talk to them, figure, apologize, you know, probe for the root cause, figure out why, get that back, that knowledge back into the company. And we found the best companies were doing that out with frontline supervisors. So the knowledge was coming back where action would change and learning would be, have the greatest impact, not a central headquarters place that has real smart anal analysts but really can't affect how frontline people think very well. Then we had net promoter surveys. Um, transactional surveys are good but not as powerful as relationship surveys. That provided a very good star. Today we have digital signals. When, you know, when, when people are rage dial, there's something wrong, you can learn from that and you can guide your ship away from it. Or if you see people uh, referring friends, that, that's pretty powerful. Employee surveys. Now, brilliant people like Andy Taylor, um, they can gather, they see that constellation and they know that in that, uh, in that cloud, uh, there is a true North Star. But they can sort of see the center. Um, they see an angel, I think. But uh, us, us normal, and PRISM gives a little bit closer to the heart of the angel. PRISM from uh, the data of Net Promoter measured correctly. But the one thing that just lights up the right pole star, the right guide star, is net revenue retention and even clearer referrals. And remember, those two things together are what com comprise earned growth. Because net revenue retention plus referred new customers provides the real guide star for your business. It's the one thing that if, if I were evaluating my accounting staff, I would force them to be able to get this to me every month, every quarter, so that I can guide my decisions toward optimizing and making progress toward that pole star. Um, so earned growth, uh, is, is the message I hope you take away from this. Why is referral such a central part of this? Even though for most businesses, net revenue retention might be a bigger component, because referrals are the purest signal there that exists of whether you've enriched a life. Some people are gonna come back for more just because it's easier. They are already doing business with you. You know, you, you gotta really irritate them for them to go away. But you don't refer to a friend 
unless that's something really special right now. And so in terms of being real-time feedback of have you, uh, have you uh, made progress with your business or on your right path, referrals is the center. And this angel, we I talk about inspiring your workforce. Everybody who works in your company, now they're not going to understand net present values necessary or customer lifetime values or maybe even earn growth rate, but they will understand are we treating people the way I'd want my lo a loved one treated, the way I'd want my grandchildren treated, the way I'd my, my dear old mother treated? That idea is the core behind earned growth. What I hope you'll do is both, is have the accountants make that, that guide star visible to everyone so progress can be measured versus that as your center but then inspire the workforce, because what you're doing here is pretty damn good. You are indeed not just talking about making the world a better place, but you're enriching lives in a measurable way that, uh, that I think is what drives innovation and, uh, and, and a, a workforce that, that's committed to doing something very special. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, the guys who are going to show you how, how Mention Me and referral can play a vital role in making progress toward earned growth. And if you have thoughts, you know, I'd sign up for the, uh, it's a free LinkedIn uh, newsletter called Customer Obsession or, or Get in Touch. But this is a change in mindset. It is not just a slight variation in direction. It is a different way to think about business. Thank you. <laughs>